Okay. Today, I'm going to speak on the Zadok priesthood and the sons of Zadok. This is something that we haven't talked about for a really long time, and we have some newer people that not really heard, don't have a clue what it is. Well, okay, good. Because I was saying, God, we all know this. But I was thinking, okay, maybe there's somebody on the internet that needs to know a little bit. And this won't be a super in-depth study. This is just a little bit of what God has showed me through the years, who, who I am, who we are, of course, what this church is called to do and called to be, the Zadok priesthood. So I'm going to be in Ezekiel. <clears throat> And one of the things Ezekiel says in one of the chapters is that the hand of the Lord <clears throat> was upon Ezekiel. And in visions, God brought him to the new temple. And God showed him in these visions the gates and the windows, the posts. He showed him the arches. He showed him the dimensions, the size of, of the certain aspects of the temple, all the correct measurements it was to be. He showed him the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. And we don't have time right now to teach on all that stuff. And there's a lot in there. Sometimes I wish I could. But right now, I, there's just a couple points I want to really touch on. So in Ezekiel 40, <clears throat> I'm going to start with verse 3 and 4. And I'll probably be reading in a different translation than you do. I saw a man, this is Ezekiel talking, he said, I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. The man said to me, son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and pay attention to what I'm going, to everything I am going to show you. For that is why you have been brought here. Tell the house of Israel everything you see. And that's one aspect right there of who and what we are. As we hear what God says and the revelation and the different things that he teaches us, he's wanting us to pay careful attention, listen to everything he's showing us, listen to everything he's saying, see it all, and then the reason we've been brought here for such a time as this is we are to tell the house of Israel everything that God has showed us and is showing us. And for right now, none of us are in Israel. So the house of Israel is the church in our lives, the people that know God, okay? So God, when, when you read this and you see that God showed him, I mean, God just didn't show him the, the temple, the tabernacle, and say, isn't it beautiful? Looky there. He showed him all kinds of things from the smallest little detail of the holy little articles to how big it should be, the placement of it, the placement of where the courts were to be, where the priests were to live. That tells me right there that God wants us to know there's regulations and ordinances in his kingdom. There's um, divine protocol when we come into his place of courts and praise and and we come to minister unto him. We come to not only sing and worship, but in our day individual, and we want to talk to God. There's different protocols. There's divine, divine regiments or divine ways <clears throat> that God moves, and God wants us to move. And God wants us to be faithful to his design. As you read all this through Ezekiel, you know, God isn't saying, hey, I'm showing you this, now go do your own thing. So there's, there's things that God wants us to be faithful to his design, not our design or what we want it to be. And <clears throat> so as we go about our lives and the things of the church and, and just ministering to God, you know, we want to do everything he wants. So now I'm going to talk in, uh, drop down to 45 and 46. <clears throat> And he says, now this is another little aspect here. 
There was different rooms where priests came in and out and different, different doorways and entryways and things. But God, this angel, this, this being that spoke to Ezekiel said, the room facing south is for the Levite priests. And the, the, the priests all came from the Levite tribe. The Levitical priesthood is what they call them. So he said, the room facing south is for the Levite priests who have charge of the temple maintenance. And the room facing north is for the Levite priests who have charge of the altar. So you have two, two aspects. You have a bunch of priests that take care of the daily maintenance and, and the articles and, and, and deal with people. And then you have ones that they are in charge of the altar. And the ones that are in charge of the altar, these are the sons of Zadok. Listen. For they alone of all the Levites may draw near to the Lord to minister to him. So you have all these priests. But Zadok and the sons of Zadok, God says they're the only one. They alone are the only ones that can draw near to me, the Lord, to minister to me. The name Zadok means righteous or righteousness. It means to make just or to make right in a moral sense. Zadok and his sons, they were Levite priests as well. But they belonged into a special order. And it was um, a, a different priestly calling. And it wasn't that God says, okay, I'm going to pick you and only you and none of the rest of you. As we go on, we'll find out why the rest of them didn't maintain the order of what God had called all people to be priests unto him. All the Levites were supposed to be priests, but because of their actions, they lost that calling, and they soiled their garments, and so there was only Zadok and his sons that were left. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Zadok and his sons, they belonged in this different calling, and, and as I read that, I, I was reminded Okay, there's the whole group of Levites, and then there's the Zadok. Then there's the outer court, there's the inner court, and then inside the inner court, there's the, the most holy place, or the holies of holies, and it's separated by a big veil between that and the inner, <clears throat> inner court. And I was also thinking there was, there was Jerusalem, and there was Mount Zion, and, of course, there was all of Judah, I suppose, is that? I don't know if they're like county, states, and cities, and then little groups of the town. And I was thinking how, you know, it's aspects of like that. Even when you see Jesus and the disciples, he had 12. Well, first he had more than 12. And most of them walked away, and he was stuck with just the 12. And <laughs> stuck with them. You know what I mean? The rest of them walked away and said, your sayings are way too hard. Then there was the 12, and then what we commonly call the inner circle, the three who went a little deeper with God. And so this is all on our end. What do we want to do? How do we want to, to get rid of the things like Jana was teaching and the intimacy she was teaching? What do we want? Okay? It's all up to us. Okay? So these Zadok and his sons, they were men of great integrity. As you read about them, they had great integrity, and they were deeply committed to God and to the calling that God had upon their lives. Now, are your ears hearing? Not just for them. This is for us. Is this not what God is working in us? That we are people who are being righteous and just and making moral right. We are people that are, we're, we don't all have it yet, but we're growing up into it. People of great integrity who are very, very committed to God and his kingdom. We're very committed to the calling that God has placed on us individually and corporately. So these men were committed to the, deeply committed to the call of God on their lives and to worship him who had called them unto himself because God actually called them unto himself. They were sanctified and consecrated, which means they were set apart for God's use only. And in Ezekiel 48, 11, the word says about them, it says, the sons of Zadok who served me 
faithfully. I like that. These sons served God faithfully, and they did not go astray with the people of Israel and the rest of the Levites. So out of all, all of these people and all of these Levites, it sounds to me like you had, I don't know how many sons actually were of Zadok, but it sounds like you have this small clan, and they were the only ones that faithfully ministered to God and did not turn away into idols when all the rest of their country turned into, into idol worship for a, a span of time. They didn't go astray. And I thought, that is awesome. They must have had that intimacy. They knew that they knew who God was. They knew he was real. They knew he was precious. They knew he was special. They knew he was almighty God, powerful, the creator. They knew all these things. And therefore, they stayed faithful. And, you know, even when we read um, the people in the wilderness, the Israelites in the wilderness, you know, how many of them turned back and said, we, you know, we want to go back to Egypt. That tells me they did not have a deep relationship. They didn't have that intimacy with God that he was asking them to have. How could you ever walk away? How could you turn your back on God if you really knew him and his goodness and his awesomeness and his power and his might? <clears throat> So all the Levite priests were called to minister in the house of the Lord. But the groupings of the regular Levites, they had a responsibility to care for the holy things in the temple, the daily maintenance. But the sons of Zadok had a different calling. They were called to draw near to God himself and to serve God and to worship him. Now, horizontal ministry, that's, that's ministry going outward all around you to people, to things, to things to do. It's a necessary part, isn't it? It's a vital part of, of living. If you have no one doing and no one ministering one-on-one -on -one to people, there's, there's going to be fallout because most people will not draw close to God themselves. But... You're not supposed to stay there, right? So the Levites ministered outward to the physical tabernacle and to the Jewish people. However, this ministry is to people, and it's not so much to the Lord or to God himself. They could have and they should have, but they got stuck in just horizontal only, okay? The sons of Zadok had a vertical worship. In other words, they worshipped to God. They worshipped for God. They worshipped unto God and upward to God. This vertical ministry of Zadok is considered a very high calling to God himself. And they have a calling to God himself before they have ministry to people. Do you see the difference? Regular Levites, they just, they're very content. Even in today, in our society, they're very content to minister to people all the time, minister to people. And as long as sometimes they might have an anointing come upon them, because why? God wants his people helped. God wants his people saved, delivered, rescued. God wants his people to know the truth. But some people are content just to have the anointing fall upon them. They minister to people. They walk away, and the anointing lifts, and they don't give a rip until it's time to do it again. That's their heart. It's wrong, but that's their heart, and that's where they're stuck. But the Zadoks want to minister to God before they ever minister out. And as you look around, the reason... As you look around, the reason we're unsatisfied with most of the worship today and most of the churches today is because people are not necessarily ministering to God when they lead worship, when they preach. A lot of times you've maybe visited places and it's boring. You don't feel like God's there at all. These people have become just Levites and 
They, they don't enter into the Zadok priesthood. And they, they, don't, they don't allow that Zadok heart and anointing to come upon them. So a lot of the ministry is ego-driven. It's centered about self, and it's all about me, or it's all about the people you're ministering to. It's very humanistic. Therefore, it causes, actually, a lot of dissatisfaction in people's lives. They don't think God's real because they don't draw near to him. And God says in his word, you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. He's wooing everybody. But if you don't draw near to me, it's like he's saying, I can't draw near to you. You draw near to me, I will draw near to you. So if people are not making a concerted effort to have intimacy with God and draw near to him, and whether it's corporate times like this where we're worshiping and singing or we're intently listening to the word or we open our Bible and we begin to read, we take a walk and say, God, I want to know you. God, speak to me. God, God, I, I want to know you. If you're not having that effort, then there's not the intimacy. There's not the life. God isn't drawing near to you because we live in a system of a cosmos where Satan himself, Jesus himself said Satan is the God of this world system right now. So it's like because he's ruling that, if we're not calling out on God, it's like God has this block. He cannot step into our world unless we invite him. Because he gave that world to us, and we in turn, through Adam and Eve, gave that world to Satan. So we have to pray, or we have to call out and commune with God. <clears throat> when you sit under a true Zadok anointing, you will know it. You will know it. There is a difference. And all you got to do is look around you or visit places, and you understand the difference between a Zadok anointing and just a regular Levite anointing. And you, unfortunately, when you're a Levite, you don't, you, you're just a Levite, you usually do not know there's, you're missing something. I mean, you know there's something wrong, but you think, because you're in the midst of people that are the same way you are. You have no other clue there's anything more, deeper, richer, fuller, more exciting. The worship that comes from a Zadok anointing will lift you higher and higher into the throne room with God. You will see him as great, and you will see him as good, and you will see him as kind. You will see him as your healer, your deliverer, your savior, the lamb of God. You will see God in, in all the, a lot of the facets that he is, that he's showing. And he wants to show more facets. He, want to show, he wants to show the secrets of who he really is, his, his personality, his greatness. But we're only seeing a little bit of him yet. But what we know is good. And we're not afraid of him, are we? We love drawing near to him. It's, it's, a, it's awesome. So when you're, when, when you're under this anointing and you get lifted higher into the th very throne room of the great God, you can experience the realms of his spirit. And we have sometimes, sometimes every time we meet. You might become lost in his presence where all your focus is him alone and you start losing the focus of people around you, the problems of your day, sometimes the pain leaves, your hoarse voice gets a little bit better. Sometimes you may have pains or anxieties and they begin to lift because all of a sudden you start focusing on God and on his spirit and you get moved to a higher realm and you lose this earthly realm. So he becomes the center and then you will know the satisfaction that comes from the union of God and man. We've had times of great satisfaction. It's very addictive, isn't it? You want to be with them again, and you want to be with them more and more and more. So you'll start experiencing that satisfaction of communion with God and him having communion with you. In this place, you know that he is satisfied with your worship as well. Have you ever felt when you've worshipped where it just kind of... Pfft, 
and it fell flat, or you didn't quite attain what you were expecting, and you, know, you just didn't enter into that place where you totally ministered unto the Lord and his heart, and you got ascended, and, and you had that c- communion with God, and then you left satisfied, and you knew he was so pleased. He was so happy today. He just felt us all coming together and offering ourselves to him. The Zadok anointing isn't necessarily about training your voice or having a good voice or playing an instrument really well or dancing well or expressing yourself well. What it is, it's a God-given enablement as you've sought God, and it's an anointing that gets developed by being under his instruction. Learning his ways, hearing his voice, recognizing it, and wanting to be obedient and flowing with him. We get instructed by the Lord in the ways of the Lord. This kind of worship comes from the spirit of a man who's been touched by the spirit of God. And haven't you even not only heard ministers or worship leaders. I used to, when I first learned about this, I thought this all had to do with worship as singing because this has been back like 88 that he gave this to me. So it's like, you know, I didn't realize there could be other forms of worship than than just singing. I did not realize at that time our lives are to be an act of worship where our mind gets renewed and 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 we, we honor him and love him. And it, it says that, how does that go? It's where it is our, it's in Hebrews, where it is our spiritual act of worship. And when we minister and we serve and we wait on God. So we want our spirits to be touched by God's spirit. Then there's a life flow. There's, there's a richness and a depth to who and what we are when we do begin to minister outward. There's more than just an inch deep. You know, there's something deep because deep calls unto deep and God pours his spirit into us and he blesses us. And then we have that overflow that we pour out. The awesome presence of God is drawn to his people by true spiritual worship. And so the purpose of the Zadok anointing is to minister to God. And yet when you're in the presence of that anointing, even if you're not the one ministering, but when you're in the presence of that anointing of the Zadok, you know what? You get ministered to as well. Because God is so kind, and God is so big and so rich and so good that as we begin to worship him and the anointing comes and we begin to minister unto God as, as like a Zadok. <clears throat> that attracts the presence of God and he begins to draw near to us and we start getting blessed. So this type of spiritual worship, when we become the Zadok priesthood, it has a prophetic edge on it because God starts speaking to his people through new songs, and then a prophetic word is released by the anointing. When God God draws near, I'm going to say that again, this spiritual worship where we minister unto God begins to have a prophetic edge on it. God starts singing through us or speaking through us or moving through us or showing us visions or pictures or dreams but it'll have that prophetic edge on it and that is what gives life without a prophetic vision people perish they begin to throw off restraint the word says and that's why it is so important to court the presence of God and to get ourselves in a place of (coughs) humbleness and and pouring out submitting to God so that he can, he can move through us because when he begins to speak prophetically, it can restore hope, destiny. It can heal you in a drop of a second. It can 
breathe new life and hope into you. It can strengthen and encourage you. It, it can do anything because it's life. And what's so cool about a, pro- <coughs> excuse me, a prophetic word or prophetic song is once you get it, receive it, it's in you forever. That anointing and that residue resides in your body forever. And that's why we want to keep getting more and more and more. The more you hear God speak, the more the life comes into you and you retain it. Excuse me. We will get through this. I'm going to talk for a second about the priest Eli and his sons. And you could read about him in 1 Samuel chapter 1 through chapter 4. And it talks about Eli and his wicked sons. That's what God calls them, his wicked sons. And if you remember any of the stories about their lives, they were priests who served a fleshly, wicked religion. They were apart from God. They were in a system that was greedy for gain, and not just monetary gain, but gain for fame, gain that I am a priest and I'm somebody, and you little peons. You know, they did wicked things in the house of the Lord. If you read the stories, they manipulated people. They were ungodly and unholy. They stole um, offerings that people brought to God. That means they stole honor. They were stealing honor from God. Stealing honor from God as people would bring in their offerings to honor God, they were stealing it. They were taking the fat and the big chunks of meat and eating it and probably taking more than they needed and sold it when that, it was supposed to be for God. And so here these people would leave and they didn't know if their sins would be forgiven or not because the priests were wickedly stealing the offerings in them sacrifices and the honor of God. And I was thinking about this. um, You know, let your mind just think about places you've gone to and people you've known and ministries that that you begin to discern that I think they have a touch of Eli on them and his sons. You know, they're manipulating. They're trying to get gain. They're, they're stealing the honor of God. They're t- a lot of they're taking the honor for themselves. You know, they strut around like they are some great poppycocks, and God is to get the honor. We are just to be a vessel. You know, God flows through us, and he gives us that type of honor where he thanks us and, and rewards us, but we're not to take it on ourselves. <clears throat> so Eli and his wicked sons they had no relationship with God, it looks like. And it looks like they had absolutely no discerning. Because when um, Hannah was crying out, Eli thought she was drunk. So they didn't even know what, what God was doing in the earth in their day. They had no discernment for God. And it says that the word of the Lord was very rare in those days. Hello, these were priests. God was supposed to be talking and sharing his life with the people and all they got was wickedness and cold-hearted leadership. And Then you have Samuel who heard God at an early age. And Samuel was raised up and he loved God and he walked with God all of his days. And it says that none of Samuel's words, he was a prophet, ever fell to the ground. That means he only spoke out prophecies, what God was saying. He never spoke out of his own understanding, his own reasonings. He never made stuff up like a lot of them in the Bible. They, they would be 
priests of the, or they would be pro- called prophets of the land, and they would just prophesy whatever they thought the king wanted to hear. Samuel didn't. Samuel only spoke out what God was saying so that all the prophetic words that he gave came true. That's what it says. Isn't that awesome? I mean, would we not love to be able to be that accurate? <clears throat> Jesus was, and he was the first went on before us. So we have that ability. The sons of Zadok represent a spiritual heritage based on intimacy with God. Deep intimacy with God. They don't serve themselves, but they serve God first. First. We can, we can still serve ourselves, so to speak. You know, we don't, we don't never bathe or wash our clothes or get refreshed, but we serve God first. That's, we're not all there yet, but we're moving and growing. God's growing us up to this place where in all things, he will have the supremacy in our lives, the priority, and we will serve God first. The sons of Zadok, when they give vows to God, those vows are precious. They take it very, very um, to heart. It's not just flippant words I'll just throw out. Oh, I'll go do this, God, and I'll go do that. No, they take their vows very, very precious to God, and they have one rule. They must hear and then obey the voice of the Lord. And isn't that what we're wanting and crying out for? God, we want to hear you, and we want to know it's you so we can be willing and obedient. So that was a, that was a rule that they had to hear God and be obedient to his voice. Now I want you to listen to this. This is in Ezekiel 48, starting with 10 through 14. It talks about the physical temple. There's an area that's set aside as a special portion. So listen, don't don't just hear it naturally. Let's hear it in the spirit as well. For the priests... There will be a strip of land measuring eight and a third miles long by three and a third miles wide with the Lord's temple at the center. I just love that. God designated an area for all the priests to live. But the Lord's temple was going to be in the very center. He's supposed to be in our midst, in our very center Corporately and in our very own being. He's to be in the very center. Because he's it. Nuber uno. So he's to be the very center of our focus, the very center of our lives. <clears throat> this area is set aside for the ordained priests, the descendants of Zadok. And only Zadok's and his descendants, I might add. This area where... The temple's in the center. There's this area. So this is for the descendants of Zadok who were faithful in serving me and did not go astray as the Levites did when the Israelites went astray. It will be a gift to them. Their special portion when the land is distributed. A most holy portion. The most sacred land of all. Next to these priests' territory, will lie the land where the other Levites will live. So they can be close, but they won't have the Lord as the very center of their lives. They could have if they want to become a Zadok, because we're talking spiritual now. Those people long died. They don't even have temple worship or anything anymore. But I just thought that was so cool. That there's this area set aside for Zadok's. It's a gift to them. And I don't see it just as physical land, you know, dirt. It could be, I suppose. But a land, a realm in the spirit that will be given to Zadok's as a special, sacred portion of land. It said it's a most holy portion, the most sacred land of all. Next to those priest territory will lie the land where the other Levites will live. None of this special land may ever be sold or traded or used by others. 
This is the best of the land and must not pass into other hands, for it belongs to the Lord. It is set apart as holy. And I thought it was interesting when I read that. It's the best of the land, and I was thinking where Jesus spoke to um, Mary and Martha. And Martha was complaining because Mary was just sitting at the Lord's feet, hanging on his every word. That's an act of worship, listening for the life coming forth from his lips. And when Martha began to plain, complain, Jesus said, Mary's chosen the best part. Mary's chosen the better thing. So I thought that was quite interesting because he said that this land, or if we could say this realm of the spirit that's given to Zadok people who minister unto the Lord first, it's the best, it's the better land. I can't wait to dwell there forever. I mean, just living in his presence here on earth. I mean, you know, we don't have to die and go to heaven to get this. Okay, now I'm going to read in Ezekiel 44, that this is how the other Levites went astray. We're going to learn some of what they did. <clears throat> Starting in verse 4, this is Ezekiel talking. There was a man or an angel. It said, Then the man brought me by the way of the north gate to the front of the temple. I looked and saw the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. There's worship. I fell upon my face. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, look carefully. Listen closely. And set your heart to see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the regulations of the house of the Lord and all his laws. Give attention and set your heart to know who are allowed to enter the temple and who are those are excluded from the sanctuary. Because he wants them to know, not just to point them out, but so we don't step in these traps, okay? So give attention and know. Set your heart to know. I thought that was really good. Who are allowed to enter the temple and all those who are excluded from the sanctuary or the temple. And you shall say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, O oh, you house of Israel, let all your previous abominations be enough for you. Do not repeat them. You have brought into my sanctuary aliens, people who have no heart for God, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh. You've brought them to be in my sanctuary to pollute and profane it, even my house. When you offer me bread, the fat and the blood, and through it all, and in addition to all your detestable practices, they and you have broken my covenant. And when I read that, I was thinking, you know, these just aren't people that, quote, come to church. But he says that the Levites brought foreigners or aliens into the temple, people that have no heart for God. They're uncircumcised in their hearts and in their flesh. That they brought them into the sanctuary because these Levites didn't want to really do all the ministry. So they got these other people to come. And I think about today, sometimes you've been at certain churches or certain places and you can tell they've paid people they've hired people to come in to minister but they don't really have a heart for god there's other motives going on there sometimes it's money how many times years ago in the 80s we would hear of certain ministries they would come in and they would minister and they'd sing but they had to have a guaranteed honorarium of ten thousand dollars that was in the 80s Big name people. Sounds to me like <clears throat> these are people that their motive isn't to minister to God and let the overflow be to the people. And I realize there probably is people 
and churches that are wicked and they withhold offerings. But isn't that supposed to be, be, you know, let it be between me and the Lord? You know, let him deal with these things. If God told you to go, then you go, whether you pay your own way. The thing is, is so many people are doing ministry and they're sending themselves. They're not being sent by God. There's, they may have a gifting because the gifting and callings are without repentance. God doesn't pull them away from you. But some of these people, they come in and then they pollute and they profane the sanctuary of God. They're offering God bread, the fat, which is the richness, and the blood, the life. They're offering these things to God. They say they're offering, but they're doing it pollutedly. <clears throat> so it goes on and says, instead of carrying out your duty, because remember the Levites were to do the duties of the temple. So instead of carrying out your duty in regard for my holy things and safeguarding my sacred rituals, you have hired foreigners to please yourselves, and you have set them in charge of my sanctuary. You know, these were very detestable abominations to God. These, these things hurt his heart. These things, you know, he, he gave people jobs to do as a great honor that they could serve the Most High God. They could serve the king. And they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Hey, Paul, would you take over for me? I'll pay you five bucks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how dishonorable when the Levites were a whole tribe, they were called by Almighty God for generations and generations to serve him in his temple. But I'm sure that's going on today. But we don't want this to go on in our heart, do we? We want this not to be like that. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, <clears throat> no foreigner uncircumcised in flesh and in heart who have not surrendered themselves to the Lord shall enter into my sanctuary where no one but the priest might enter. None of any foreigners who are among the children of Israel. I just love that in my Bible where it said <clears throat> that God said no foreigner uncircumcised in their heart or in their flesh who have not surrendered themselves to the Lord. That must be something very special to God. He wants us to surrender ourselves to him. We can't come in to the temple, the sanctuary, where it's the most holy place and minister unto God if we've not surrendered to him. And it may not be a full surrender yet, but haven't we been surrendering bits and pieces as God shows us? We say, yes, God. I humble myself. Take it. Clean me up. I love you, God. But the Levites who abandoned me when Israel went astray, who went astray from me after their idols, they shall bear the consequences for their iniquity and guilt. And what is the consequence? They can't be in the sanctuary. Yeah, it will bring death, but they can't be next to God. So these, this is some things we want to watch for. We don't want to be Levites who abandon God and go astray after our own idols. It says, then they shall bear the consequences of their iniquity and guilt. They shall minister in my sanctuary, having oversight as guards at the gates of the temple and ministering in the temple. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people and they shall stand before the people to serve them. And that's because the priests ministered to the people and served them in the presence of their idols. They encouraged my people to worship idols, causing Israel to fall into deep sin. Have you not seen that in the church? In the 80s and 90s, I mean, you saw it everywhere. And I, I don't really watch Christian TV anymore to see that kind of stuff. But because they ministered to the people only and served them in the presence of their idols. And, they, and 
when people saw that puffed upness or that haughtiness, that I am something special, it caused a lot of God's people to want to be haughty toddy too and to hot dog the Holy Ghost and, and to say, God's on you when God wasn't on you. I mean, we've seen that before through the years. You know, caused God's people to fall into deep sin and think, I'm okay. The pastor's doing it. The evangelist is doing it. I'm okay. How about if people look at one of us and say, well, pff, you know, they lie. They cheat on their taxes. They don't, you know, they're not being totally honest. They say they're, they're walking with God and we all know they're gossips and cheats and horrible people. We can't have that. We'll cause people that look at us to fall into deep sin because we're all called to be leaders. They will follow the leader. We want to be clean, holy, and pure. So because these priests ministered to the people and served them in the presence of their idols and encouraged my people to worship idols, causing Israel to fall into deep sin, therefore I, God, have lifted up my hand and taken a solemn oath against them, says the Lord God, that they shall bear the consequences for their iniquity and their guilt. They shall not come near to me to serve me as priests, nor come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. For they must bear their shame and the consequences for all the detestable sins they have committed. I mean, that would break our heart if we heard God say, you cannot come near to me anymore. You will never come minister to me. You will never come near my holy things, my holy people. We don't want that. So that's why we're cleaning our hearts out, trying to be a vessel of honor. <clears throat> and then God goes on and says, and yet I will put them as caretakers in charge of the duties of the temple for all the maintenance work and performing general duties. However, the Levitical priests of the family of Zadok continued to minister faithfully in the temple when Israel abandoned me for idols. They shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me in my presence to offer to me the sacrifices of fat and the blood, says the Lord God. That just gives me chills. This is where we're going. This is why we worship and try with all of our heart. And we draw near to God so he can blow out the death and the ugliness so that we won't follow idols and we won't cause other people to follow idols and that we can come near to God and minister to him and stand in his presence. You know, a lot of the Israelites, they couldn't. <clears throat> and then he goes on and says, they alone, no one else, but they alone are to enter into my sanctuary. They alone are to come near my table to minister unto me. And they will fulfill all my requirements. Yes, God, we want that. What a promise that we not only get to come near to God, but we will fulfill all of his requirements. You know, there's a lot of requirements we don't know yet. For one reason, we're, we're ignorant, we're Gentiles, we don't understand things. We've been taught linear ways of thinking. We've been taught, can't believe it unless you see it. We've been taught a lot of things that we're trying to allow God to weed it out of us. But he's given us promises. If we make ourselves vessels of honor and get to minister unto him, he's going to clean us up and we will fulfill all of his requirements. Then he goes on and he says, and I don't know that I'll spend much time on this. Um, when they enter the gates of the inner court, they are to wear linen garments. Remember Le Revelation, it talks about the linen garments 
They're the righteous acts of the saints. Remember, Zadok's name was righteous and righteousness. So we're to wear righteous and just acts of the saints. That's where we're doing what God tells us to do. For no other motive, not to puff ourselves and say, hey, do you know what I did today, Justine? I got to minister, and I saw 45 people healed, and I, you know, gave the biggest offering of the whole church. You know, right there showing you something's not right with that person's heart. So we need, we need righteous acts clothed with righteousness, clothed with righteous worship. You know, worship is a garment of praise, and it's to be a clean white linen. It says, no wool shall be on them while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within the temple. And I know wool itches. Wool is hot. And I know you get wool from sheep, and I wondered if God was saying, don't fleece my sheep when you minister to them. Anyway, they shall have linen turbans on their head, so our thoughts should be protected with clean, righteous, and just thoughts, and linen undergarments around our waists. They must not wear anything that causes them to sweat. Isn't that self-effort? You work up a sweat trying to do things for God or trying to do things for the glory of your own name. But when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, he possesses you, flows through you, and you minister. You're not sweating. You just kind of go along for the ride. I mean, you have to say yes and sometimes open your mouth or touch somebody or whatever it is. Open your pocketbook and give. But it's... it's there's a joy with it, an effortlessness to it, because you're allowing God, it's God doing through you. It's not you doing these works. You're yielding, as you minister to God, you're yielding, and because you're his body, he does it through you. He's doing these works. So there's no sweat, because you ain't doing it. You're allowing him to do it. And when they go out into the outer court to the people, they shall take off the clothes that they've been ministering in and lay them in the holy chambers and put on other clothes so that they do not consecrate the people or set them apart for holy use unintentionally or un unfittingly. Sometimes I think that also means sometimes when you've been ministering to the Lord and you're just so full of it, you're just full of him, full of life. Full of, maybe you go to your family or you go to um, the high V and you're just, you're just throwing your, casting your pearls before swine. God wasn't setting up things for you to minister to that person, but out of, you're just, you know, we did today, and we did this, and God did this, and, you know, there's times where you speak to people, but it sounds like to me there's times where when you're in a place of, of total ministering to the Lord and that life flows going back and forth, you don't just go blab your mouth to anybody and everybody saying how wonderful God's been because they don't get it. And, and it says unless the Lord is drawing people by his Spirit, they can't be pulled close. They can't. But it's like it, it's, you're consecrating them. You're setting them apart without the Spirit of the Lord drawing their heart. And it's like the enemy can knock them over the head a little more because God wasn't drawing them. So they didn't have that protection where God was wooing their heart at that moment. And you're just throwing out a bunch of exciting information that God didn't say, you know. So sometimes you take these outer garments off and you leave them in the holy place. They must not shave their heads or allow their hair to grow too long, but they are to keep the hair of their heads trimmed. No priest is to drink wine when he enters, when he enters the inner court. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow 
or a woman separated or divorced from her husband. They may only marry they may marry only virgins of Israelite descent or a widow previously married to a priest. The priests, and these are the Zadoks, remember, the priests shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern and distinguish between the unclean and the clean. So we are to be teachers as well as ministering unto God. When he sends us that the holy, I looked that word up, it means sacred, consecrated, and set apart. And we always say for God's use only. So we are to teach people what is really holy and, and consecrated unto God and what is profane, which means exposed or common. And I thought exposed was kind of funny because when it's a holy thing of God, it's, it's usually, it's pretty much a secret. And even in the natural, only one high priest went back behind the holiest of holies. So what was back there was pretty much a secret, wasn't it? I mean, he probably came out and told some people, but he just didn't get a bullhorn and tell everybody on the streets, hey, guess what God looks like back there? Look what he said to me. Hey, no, no, no. But you're to teach people what's holy and what's profane, exposed, or common. Because God is special, set apart, holy. His things are special. I also thought of when, what was his name, Abihu and his brother, Aaron's sons, they, they offered strange fire to the, to the Lord. And I thought, that was profane. They did that on their own strength and their own power. God didn't tell them to. They just thought this will be a good idea. This will help. This will save people. And they ran in and got, I guess they probably lit, I don't know, they had matches back then, but however they started fire, they lit fire, you know, and it was profane. It wasn't what God wanted on his altar and for the people. And we are to teach and cause people to discern and distinguish between the unclean, which means defiled and polluted, and the clean, which is pure. To me, that speaks also of motives. You know, we, we're to teach people as we go along, as they worship God. You teach them the polluted from the clean. You know, why are your motives? Why are you doing what you do? Why do you say what you say? Why do you minister? Why do you um, give an offering like the Pharisees did. It said to be seen of men. Some of them, they blew trumpets. Here comes Pharisee such and so. He is now giving a huge offering. You think there's a little bit of a motive. It's all about me and I want to promote my own self and let everybody think, wow, what a holy, holy man. So as we, as we distinguish the clean and the unclean, we check our motives. We find things that we're doing that God didn't tell us to do or ways that he didn't tell us to do it that way. He told us to do it another way and we're doing it the way we want to do it or the way that's comfortable to me. And we do our wants instead of his wants. That's unclean. That's defiled and polluted. And in a controversy, they shall act as judges, and they shall judge according to my judgments. Not their own judgments, but according to God's law, his word. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed feasts. And they shall keep my Sabbaths holy. And I'm going to drop down. He, he talks about don't uh, go near a dead person and be defiled. Um, I'm going to drop down to 27 on the day that he goes into the sanctuary, into the inner court, to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, says the Lord God. This, their ministry to me, shall be to them as an inheritance. For I am to be the only inheritance the priests have. You are to give them no possession in Israel, for I am their special possession. And that reminded me of what he told Abraham, he said, I 
am your shield and your exceeding great reward. So God was saying to these Zadok priesthood that they are to have no other possession in the land. They don't own anything. They have God and he has them. I mean, I was reading that last night and I was thinking, what would it be like to know that you know that you know that God Almighty is your very own special possession? The God of the universe, this huge God, that he belongs to you. You have nothing else but him that you, quote, own or belong to or who belongs to you. Yes, they had families, but you know what I mean? It was like God was their all in all. Everything they needed, they looked to him. God fed them. God provided their their land, their homes, the, th the food that they ate came from the portion that God said they could have when all the people in Israel would bring their tithes and bring their offerings. Portions of it belonged to the priests because they ministered to the Lord. They couldn't go out and get a regular job. They ministered to the Lord. They, they delighted his heart. They waited on him. What do you want, God? What would you like us to do today? So I just thought that was really, really something that God said. Their ministry to me shall be to them as an, as an inheritance for I am. You know, the great I am. I am to be the only inheritance these priests have. You are to give them no possession in Israel for I am their special possession. We've been crying out for true worship for a long time in this place. We're getting closer and closer, nearer and nearer, more than 20 years ago for sure. I see even growth 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, even less as we go along. We've been crying out for true worship. We see changes in our lives. What does that mean? He's answering our cries. He's changing us into Zadok priesthood. People that will minister unto God first. That he is all we want. He's all we need. He's our special possession. We have nothing of value but him. But in that, he has us. And he provides everything we need. He's making us into a Zadok priesthood. I'm going to read <clears throat> Isaiah 60, starting in verse 11, where God is promising. This is a different version, too, I think. So there's parts of it that's really good. <clears throat> God says, I will glorify the house of my glory. Therefore, your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. Didn't God tell us back in 2008 that he'd called this to be a place where he, we can feast in his presence and where his name, his name, his, his act, his character, his authority would be honored? And I was thinking of that because he says he will beautify the place of his sanctuary and he will make the place of his feet glorious. He comes here. <laughs> and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Although you have been forsaken, despised and hated, with no one traveling through, 
that kind of about been the truth? <clears throat> Though you've been forsaken, despised and hated with no one traveling through, I will make you an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. And you shall know that I, the Lord, is your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of brass, I will bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you brass and iron in place of stones. It's like the stones turn into iron, to brass, to silver, to gold. It's like we get purified more and more. He exchanges us, and he promises. He doesn't drive everything out in one year, but we're getting a, we used to be a vessel of stone, then we become wood, then become iron and brass, and then silver and then gold, till we become a vessel of honor where there's no impurities in us. <clears throat> God goes on and says, I will make peace your governor. That's pretty good. <clears throat> I will make peace your governor and righteousness your ruler. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. <clears throat> then will your people be righteous, Zadok's, <laughs> and they will possess the land forever that I may be glorified. The least of you will become a thousand and the smallest a strong nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. And you will be called priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. <clears throat> actually mine says and you will be named the priests of the Lord and men shall call you the ministers of our God <laughs> it sounds to me there would be a recognition in the spirit that you know God and you could show me how to know God you know when the when the priests left the presence of God you know, the high priest, he burnt incense and stuff and had the prayers. You know, he, he reeked of that incense and perfume. And if he, he, they had to leave their clothes there and change into other clothes. But unless they took a bath with something strong, they would smell. Everywhere they went, they would have that fragrance of Christ, it says in the New Testament. Everywhere they'd go, there would be, they'd say, there's, there's a priest of the Lord, a minister unto God. Because I recognize that smell is like no other. Nobody else could make that, that perfume. It was only, only for the most holy place. So people would know that awesome smell. So that's who he's calling us to be. He's naming us to be priests of the Lord, ministers unto our God, Zadok priesthood that comes near unto him and ministers unto him before we ever turn and minister unto people or do natural things in the sanctuary. That's why years ago when I had that booklet and I'd have people clean the church, I'd say, don't just come in and do it. You do it as an act of worship to God. You pray about it. You do it with joy in your heart and, and you enjoy this time with God as you're physically working on this sanctuary. <clears throat> We're going to have that prophetic word. This was given in 1985. I didn't get it until, I know, way older than you. <laughs> 
I didn't get it until uh, probably 1990 to 92, somewhere around there. And I've always loved it because it always touched my heart. I, it just spoke to me. And at that time, I'd never heard anybody else ever know anything about ministering unto God or the Zadok or, you know, it was all me, 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 because I was growing up in the 80s, the Word of Faith movement or whatever, and of course it was all about me. It was never about God. It's God, you know, let me do this little rule so you'll do my bidding. It was awful. We were polluted, and we polluted his sanctuary. But God is gracious, and he begins to unveil and open our eyes so we see and know that we don't have to stay polluted. We can become the Zadok priests. We can get our nature changed. <clears throat> so this is called the eye of the needle. And Charlotte Baker prophesied it way back then. So about eight, eight, 13 minutes, something like that. That's all right. Go ahead and play it without that or play part of what's on there and and whoever borrows it won't get it all. But Oh, wait a second. She says at the very beginning, it's really hard to hear, she's talking about ministering and when I was very young. And then she goes into what God has showed her. And given to the purposes of my God. And upon that day I said unto the Lord, I will do mighty exploits in the name of my God. And the Lord came unto me and he said, What is it, son of man, that thou wouldest have? And I said, Lord, if I could only be among those who play sweetly upon an instrument, and who sing well in the house of the Lord, then would I do great things for my God. And the Lord came unto me, and he gave unto me the desire of my heart, and he stood me among the sons of men, and he let me play, and he let me sing. And I saw the day when the hearts of men were moved by that thing which the Lord had given unto me. And as the hearts of men were moved, I stood back and I said within myself, Now will I be content, for I have been able to move the hearts of men. But in my secret hour, I bowed my head before my God. And I said, Lord, thou hast given me what I asked for. But tonight my heart is heavy, and I have a longing for something more. And he came again unto me in the night season. And he said, Son of man, ask me again the thing that thou wouldst have of me. And I said, Lord, I see men bowed by burdens low. I see hearts that are broken. I see sadness and discouragement. Oh, give me but the power of the spoken word that I might speak a word and hearts will be delivered. And the word of the Lord came unto me and he said, Son of man, I have given thee the thing that thou dost desire. And with great joy I marched before the people of God. And in my youth and my enthusiasm, I spoke the word and men were delivered. And I spoke the word and their hearts were made whole. And I knew what it was to bind the brokenhearted, to pour in the oil of joy for mourning. And while men were praising him and magnifying his name, I went back to my secret chamber and I bowed my head in sorrow and I said, oh my God, my God, I am not satisfied, I am not satisfied, I am not satisfied. And he came again unto me and he said, son of man, what is it that thou dost again desire? And I said, oh my God. Give me but power in my hands that as thou didst do, I might lay my hands upon the sick 
that I might see healing flow, that I might have power. And he said, it is done as thou hast commanded. God, heal the sick in my name. And I went to the nations of the earth, and I saw the sick raised from their sick beds. And I saw pain and suffering go. And I was rejoicing as I went to my place. And I bowed my head before my God, and I said, Now shall I be satisfied, for thou hast given me that which I have desired. But no longer had the words come out of my mouth, until the heart within me began to ache and cry. And I said, God, I do not understand this, for again my heart is sad. And I said, Lord, wilt thou just one more time give me the thing I ask of thee? And he said, it is done. And I said, God, I desire to go against principalities and powers and the powers of the wickedness of this world and spiritual darkness in high places. And he said, surely I give it unto thee, now go. And I went and the Lord allowed me to go into dens of iniquity and holes and dives where men hide from the light because of the sin and the evil that is upon them. And there was a day when I saw demons cry out at the very presence of the power of God that rested. And then I went back to my place broken. And I said, God, I have asked thee for all that I desire and still my heart is not satisfied. Nor do I feel that I have touched the thing thou hast called me to. And in my youth, I had expended myself with all the things that my heart had desired. And then one more time, a gracious and a loving God visited me in the night season and he said, Now, what is it that thou dost desire? And in brokenness of heart, I bowed before him and I said, God, only that thing which thou dost desire to give unto me. And he came unto me and he said, Come with me and I will take thee on a journey. And he took me past my friends. And he took me past those with whom I had come into the house of the Lord. And he took me into a desolate place. And he caused me to go into a place alone in the wilderness. And I said, oh my God, now thou hast cut me off from those I love. What art thou doing unto me? And he said, I take thee to the place that all men must come to if their heart's cry is to be fulfilled. And on a certain hour, I bowed before a gate that is called the Eye of the Needle. And there, before the Eye of the Needle, I heard the voice of the Lord say, Bow low. And I bowed low. And he said, No, lower. And I bowed lower, and he said, No, yet lower, thou dost not go low enough. And I went as low as I could go. But I had upon my back my books of learning, and I had with me my instruments of music, and I had with me my gifts and abilities. And he said unto me, Thou hast too much, thou canst not go through this gate. And I said, God, thou hast given me these books, and thou hast given me these abilities. And he said, drop them, or thou dost not go. And I dropped them. And I went through a very small gate that is called the eye of a needle. And as I went through this gate, I heard the voice of the Lord say, now rise to the other side and as I rose a very strange thing had happened unto me for lo the gate which was so small that I must lay aside everything was so wide I could not fill it and as I stood in the presence of the Lord I said is this thing that thou hast done unto me for my soul is now satisfied and he said thou hast come through the gate of worship thou hast come through the gate of worship now come up to the circle of
of the earth, and I will show thee a great mystery, and I will reveal unto thee the thing which I am doing among the sons of men. And the Spirit of the Lord caught me away, and he took me to the circle of the earth, uh, higher than the eagle flies, beyond where the clouds can number, beyond where the sun shines or the moon finds her path. And there at the throne of my God, he said, look down upon my people. And I saw a strange thing. I saw my companions gathered around a very small gate. And I saw them wringing their hands and crying and saying one to another, God hath given us these instruments of war. This sword is my sword. I will whip thee at my sword and I will work with the enemy and I will bring the enemy down. I cannot go through this gate. For if I go through this gate, I must put down my sword. I must put down my instruments of war. And God hath called me to be a warrior, therefore will I not do it. And I heard another one say, Me, lay down my instruments of music. Lay down all that God hath given to me to go through that silly little gate, to be nothing but a bare man who comes out on the other side, stripped of everything. I cannot do this thing. And I saw, as they stood aside in their pride, afraid to bow themselves before a very small gate. And then I saw again, as the Lord brought me, closer to the gate and I saw men bow low laying down everything they had and as they came through the very wide gate on the other side their instruments of music were there their swords were there their books were there the power was there and the word of the Lord came unto me go now and tell this people this thing I have given unto this people extreme talent and much ability I have caused you who are instrumentalists to play but I say unto you this night if you do not come through the very small gate which is the gate of worship and bow low and lay before me thine instruments and thy talents and thy abilities and thy vision and thy power thou shalt always be those who will only be able to minister to the hearts of men and bless the hearts of men but there is a gate open in the church in this hour which is a very small gate and through that gate only men who are worshipers will go and these men will fall on their face before me and these men will lay their talents before their God and these men will say God we will be worshipers and through that wide gate they will come and as they come through that wide gate here hear the word of the Lord they will arise on the other side not to minister unto men but to minister unto their God and I have brought this people together this night to make unto you a choice you can minister unto men and I will cause you to sway the hearts of men with your talent or you can go through a very small gate and in making you worshipers you will minister unto the king you the king the king of glory we want to love you we want to serve you. We want to minister unto you. <sighs> Father, we ask that this revelation goes across the world, God, where people will know that you don't give gifts and take it back, but you want us to be worshipers of you, to minister unto you. You created us to worship you. You created us to draw near to you to fellowship with you, to love you, to become one with you, communing with you. And out of that overflow, we minister your life to people. God, cause the seeds of what you're stirring in people's heart to go forward, God. That this takes over the land, God. 
that you alone would be our secret, our special possession. That you belong to us and we belong to you. That's what we want, God. Where you are all in all. We have need of nothing because we have you. And in having you, we have everything. That's just how you are. You're such a giver. But God, we confess we do not know how to give you everything. We don't know yet how to give you everything that we are. But we want to be made into real worshipers. Real worshipers. We love you, God. We love you. We love you, God. We love you. Yeah, we love you, God. We want you to be blessed. We want you to be blessed. That you have pockets of people all over the world that are worshipers that you mean everything to them, God. We love you, God. Now we love you, God. Now we love you, God. Any questions or you have any comments to add? No. Anyone? Thank you, Father, for this special day that you open your heart to us, God, and you touch us so we can open our heart better to you. You are precious to us. And our vows to you are very precious to us. And we want to have full commitment to you. Strong commitment to you. That we will never run away from you and serve our idols. But we would throw away our idols. And always be close to you. Always faithfully minister unto you. You love faithfulness. And we love faithfulness, too, God. You are very faithful to us. We love you, God. We love you, Holy Spirit. And we love you, Jesus Christ. What would we do without you? Cease to exist. Amen. <laughs>